1939 and the flames of war are about to consume the world. The Japanese are moving deeper into China. Spain has fallen to dictator Francisco Franco in a civil war. Italy and Germany create the infamous Rome-Berlin axis. When Germany invades Poland, Britain and then France declare war against the Germans and the Second World War has begun. Women and children are evacuated from London as the British prepare for air attacks. The new invention radar is installed at British anti-aircraft gun sites. President Roosevelt declares the United States neutral in Europe's new war, but he signs a law that makes the sale of war materials to the Allies legal. America, still struggling to recover from the Depression, is suddenly into boom times as orders for planes and ships and other war materials have an electrifying effect on the American economy. Science takes a critical turn this year, too. A demonstration shows that the atom can be split to release nuclear energy. Albert Einstein writes President Roosevelt about the possibility of building an atomic bomb. The world is on the brink of a new and for many a frightening era. This and much more is the year 1939. Let's watch. Highlights of the great game that thrilled 91,000 fans in the Rose Bowl in the country's big midwinter classic. And here's Duke's mighty Eric the Red Tipton in action. A pass to McAfee, good for plenty of yards. Robertson of Duke takes the ball for a five-yard gain. Tony Ruffa tries a field goal for Duke from the 23-yard line, and it's a beauty. Duke's three points look good as the clock runs out, but USC never says die. Lansdale is the spearhead of the Trojan attack. Doyle Nave, a substitute back, in the game for the final minute or so, starts an amazing barrage of successful passes. And in the last minute of play, a pass to Al Kruger, racing to the end zone, wins the game for USC. After holding out for 29 months of siege and bombardment, Madrid, principal stronghold of Red Spain, has fallen to General Franco's nationalist forces. The capitulation was almost bloodless and marked by a complete collapse of the Red regime. The loyalist soldiers surrendered by the thousands and the task of feeding the starving population was the major task faced by the victors. The fall of Madrid was the signal for unrestrained celebrations throughout nationalist Spain, with General Franco wildly hailed in scenes such as these. Valencia and other loyalist centers rapidly were overrun by Franco troops after the capture of Madrid, bringing to an end the bitter, bloody civil war that has cost a million lives and wrecked the country. What Spain's future will be, only Franco knows. Fleeing from Madrid, where certain death awaited her at the hands of the victorious nationalist La Passionara, the passion flower of Red Spain, arrives in Paris on her way to Moscow. A fiery Red leader for years, she was one of the spark plugs of the loyalist regime. Mussolini's overpowering of Albania was a well-planned invasion. First pictures of the occupation show. 
Durazzo here and other harbors were suddenly filled with Italian transports and war vessels and the debarking columns rapidly pushed inland in all directions. And you can see where Italian shells took their toll of damage. With all this show of might and force, there was nothing much the little Albanian army could do about it. Looks as if he's halted the entire column. No, it's a native giving eggs away that's causing the delay. And this is how Italy's gobbling up Albania. Following the tanks, truckload after truckload of troops occupy Tirana, the capital. Albania has its fascists too, it seems. When everything quiets down, Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, arrives to arrange the terms of Albania's annexation by Italy. But the Italian coup started a train of world events. The British and French fleets have closed in on the Adriatic, ready for action. While Prime Minister Chamberlain, on vacation in Scotland at the time of the coup, has since changed Britain's policy from appeasement to threats against further aggression. Only eight months more till Christmas. So here's a preview of a few of next season's toys shown at the American Toy Fair. Taking advantage of the preview, Parents Magazine has arranged for a selected group of toy experts to look them over and try them out. Right now, the board of experts is looking into the transportation situation. But there are many other matters that need consideration too. How would you like to find this in your Christmas stocking? Gene Tunney drops the flag at the Indianapolis Speedway and 33 speed demons roar across the starting line in the 1939 Memorial Day 500 mile classic. 150,000 racing fans are here, out for thrills and believe you me, they'll get them if this pace keeps up. Ow! Bob Swanson's in a bad skid, and he's hit. Hit by Floyd Roberts. Roberts' car goes over the outside fence. Chet Miller crashes into the infield fence, trying to dodge the other smash-up as Swanson's car bursts into flames. Swanson luckily was thrown clear of his burning car, but he is badly injured nevertheless. And so is Miller, whose car turned over in the infield. The injured men are rushed to the hospital, but Roberts, who won last year's race, dies within a few minutes. The end of a famous racing career. Swanson's lucky he was thrown out of the inferno, and there's what's left of Miller's car. The race slowed down until firemen can put out the burning gas and oil in Swanson's car so as to clear the track. But finally, they hit it up again to 120 miles an hour and more. The race must go on. Oh, it's Lou Meyer. He threw his shoe and it cost him the race, for it gives a lap or more lead to Wilbur Shaw, who won two years ago, as he roars across the line, a two-time winner. Twenty-eight men of war steam into New York Harbor at dawn, the Navy's tribute to the New York World's Fair. The largest group of ships to visit here in five years joined seven other vessels of the newly created Atlantic Squadron to give New Yorkers a rare thrill. Miss Liberty greets the Texas and New York, two of the three battleships here along with five light cruisers, numerous destroyers, seven submarines, and the aircraft carrier Ranger. The pride of the Navy, manned by 12,000 officers and men, all anxious to get ashore for a close-up look of New York and the fair. Lady Cups, 200 of them, cops for a day, as a feature of Sacramento's Safety Week observance. And this is one day that hubbies and brothers and sweethearts had better watch their step. There's nothing like a policeman's uniform to help a girl throw her weight around. It's no day to step on the gas either. This day will even up a lot of smart aleck remarks about women drivers. Uh-oh, she seems a little too peppy for a real traffic cop. But it's no time for joking. 
Oh, no. That is not her telephone number he's getting. First picture is from Tianjin, storm center of northern China, where a blockade of the British concession by Japanese army troops has set the Orient in a turmoil. For hours, whites as well as natives are held at the barriers while credentials are checked. Stories of indignities and ill treatment of British citizens by Japanese at these inspection points have inflamed Britons everywhere. Meanwhile, the movement of food and supplies by truck or by boat to the beleaguered British area is halted by Japanese patrols, ashore and afloat. The British are virtually besieged as the outcome of charges of anti-Japanese activities. Food stocks are running low, and the situation of British residents is serious. In spots, high-voltage wires close in the concession. The trouble began when the British chief of police arrested four Chinese terrorists and refused to turn them over to the Japanese authorities. The Japanese consul general protested and Tokyo seized the opportunity to make a grave matter of the affair. The British consul Jameson was helpless and in the end, Britain had to make far-reaching concessions to Japan on her policy in China. Meanwhile, the anti-British campaign is spreading and now stronger anti-American activities are reported by American consul general Caldwell. And to add to the situation, Major Taki of the Japanese Army has organized a force of white Russians into an anti-communist unit, which is expected to grow into a sizable force of thousands, which is also showing anti-British trends. Japan's long-cherished domination of the Orient thus has taken a big step forward. Sixty thousand fans gather at the Yankee Stadium as the baseball world and various notables pay homage to Lou Gehrig, the famous iron horse of Yankee history, recently cut down in his prime by a form of infantile paralysis. It's Lou Gehrig Day, and gifts and testimonials pour in upon him in a remarkable tribute. That I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you. Spots before your eyes, displayed by 200 freckle-faced kids, parading before cute judges and a freckleograph in the fifth annual contest staged by the Boys Club here. If the machine okays you, you might become champ. But there's monkey business afoot. Mark my words. Yep. Those freckles ain't yours, so scram! While the gang roars approval, a winner is crowned. Harry Gottlieb, only 15, but he's already been kissed. Marking the 30th anniversary of the Army Air Corps, a huge super bomber, one of the Army's flying fortresses, lands in New York, just nine hours and 14 minutes after leaving Burbank, California. Major Olmsted, with a cigar, commanded the giant plane during the amazing flight, which should be an eye-opener for foreign airmen. Startling scenes as the terror-stricken Chinese inhabitants of Chongqing flee at the approach of Japanese bombing planes. It's a hell on earth. In the midst of almost continuous raids, the Chinese people carry on, though, helping the Chinese army to tear up the railway lines so as to delay the Japanese advance. And by battalions, Chinese girls have taken their places in the fighting forces. Trained by months of bitter warfare, the Chinese army is still giving a good account of itself. John Cobb 
amateur speed driver. If you call driving at this clip amateurish, shoots down the 13-mile Bonneville course for a new land speed record. The first run was made at the phenomenal speed of nearly 371 miles an hour. And on the return trip, he shoots the length of the measured mile in nine and four-fifth seconds. Cobb boosts Captain Ice Tons mark 11 and a half miles an hour to a fraction less than 368 miles an hour. The only improvement in safety glass in nearly a decade may be on your new car this fall. Through this new glass, the girl can read print easily and without distortion. This girl now has trouble reading similar print through the present type of safety glass. For a more vivid demonstration, we'll give you an idea of what you see now as you glance through the ventilation wing on a car. The same scenery through this improved glass shows no distortion whatsoever. Well, if you want more proof, here it is. Your old type windshield, as on the left, would hardly do a pretty hitchhiker justice. Grandmother's corset is coming back, but don't get excited. Stylists don't mean this literally. They mean a streamlined version that will serve the same purpose for modern versions of what they used to wear. Shed a tear in the good old days. Glamour girl Marlena Dietrich returns from a vacation in France on her way to Hollywood and a new picture assignment. The film star is gracious with a score of reporters with nothing to say but her pleasing smile. The Women's National Tennis Finals. Alice Marble in the far court, reigning court queen, defends her title against Helen Jacobs, veteran contender. A spectacular battle. Miss Jacobs puts up a heroic fight, but succumbs to slashing play like this. The blonde Miss Marble sweeps the first set six love, but a stubborn opponent comes back to win the second 10-8. Miss Jacobs tries vainly to beat through her opponent's drive in the final set and nearly does. But her old rooters see her go down to defeat, game to the last. And there's the play that clinched the title for Miss Marble. A great winner and a great loser. In the men's finals, Bobby Riggs, member of the Davis Cup team in the far court, meets Welby Van Horn, young star who the day before downed Australia's Jack Bromwich. But today, the 19-year-old newcomer is no match for the superior strategy and drive of Riggs. Van Horn displays amazing tennis at times, only to falter under his opponent's net play and uncanny placements. Like that, for instance. The final ace, Riggs wins in straight sets, and to the winner, the coveted trophy, a new king of America's courts. The mad dog of Europe has at last plunged civilization into a new world war. Nazi troops have invaded Poland by land and by air in undeclared war. Russia paved the way for the Nazi coup by cutting loose from her Western allies and signing a non-aggression pact with Germany. Germany rushes more troops to man her great West Wall Siegfried Line. Vast underground fortifications running from Switzerland to the border of Holland. Again, the German war machine gets underway. The free city of Danzig and the Polish corridor first felt the force of Germany's pincer-like drive against the Poles. Danzig, willingly for the most part, was quickly engulfed by the Reich. A part of Poland's efficient little navy escaped to join the British fleet, but other vessels, trapped in the Baltic, fought heroically to the last. Meanwhile, the Polish army contested the German advance on every front. In the corridor, near East Prussia, 
and in Silesia. Although overwhelmed by numbers and by all the driving power of the modern German army, the highly trained Polish fighting forces, and in particular her splendid cavalry, the finest in the world, exacted bitter payment for every foot they gave. History records no brighter chapter than this heroic defense of their homeland, a masterfully conducted withdrawal action in the face of insurmountable odds. Think of their desperation and of their joy when word came that France and England had joined them. Italy, so far, has not raised a finger to help her Axis ally and pledges neutrality, but her millions are mobilized and her French frontier bristles with bayonets. Zero Hour in London. Chamberlain speaks, a state of war exists with Germany. Britain stands by her pledge to Poland and all England digs in, this time against a real threat of enemy bombers. Thousands of troops march off to war, while England's sea might sails to blockade the North Sea and the Baltic. London on guard, anti-aircraft guns ready to repel enemy bombers. These exclusive pictures show what happened in the last war when German planes rained death on London, schoolrooms blasted into destruction, helpless children trapped by exploding death, to prevent such things this time, to prevent the slaughter of the innocents, thousands of youngsters are removed to safe havens in the countryside. They're happy now. It's all a game to them. But who knows? They know not the horrors of war that already have been unleashed. Not suddenly, as in 1914, but after days of terror and superhuman peace efforts, did the New World Cataclysm break over France and England. Fearfully, housewives stocked up food supplies as the news became more ominous. Class after class of reservists were called to the colors during the days preceding Germany's final coup. And as in England, the evacuation of non-combatants from Paris and other cities swelled to a flood. Grimly, and with no lost motion, France put herself on a war footing. By the time the Nazi leader gave his troops the command to go ahead, France had completed her mobilization to the last detail. The mobilization of animals was no small part of the plan. Sturdy French farmers parted with their cherished beasts by the thousands for army transport service, and the younger classes of reservists hurried off to their battle stations. Meanwhile, as France prepared to hurl the gauntlet in the face of the Nazi warlord, French munition plants speeded up their unending supply of war machines. The sons of France are on the march again against their hereditary enemy beyond the Rhine. And the French army today is the finest in the world. The defenses of Paris are airtight. Enemy planes will find a barrier of steel guarding the throbbing heart of France. The bitter lesson of 1914 has resulted in the famous Maginot Line. For mile after mile along France's eastern and northeastern frontier are lines of steel and concrete gun turrets connected underground by vast subterranean chambers. Here, entire armies can be quartered in comfortable and air-conditioned surroundings. They shall not pass is the historic war cry of the French soldier, and the scissor-like crossfire of the Maginot Line makes doubly sure that the new world war will not be fought in France. War news, flashing 3,000 miles across the broad Atlantic. Americans, hoping for peace through the long war of nerves, finally stunned into belief. Those who remember the last war and its ghastly toll wonder what the future holds. In this new world conflict, what will America do? The eyes of the world are on the head of the American nation as he voices, by way of radio and newsreel from the White House, America's stand in the new world war in a vital message to his fellow countrymen and to the world. This nation will remain a neutral nation, but I cannot ask that every American remain neutral in thought as well. Even a neutral has a right to take account of facts. 
even a neutral, cannot be asked to close his mind or to close his conscience. I have said not once but many times that I have seen war and that I hate war. I say that again and again. I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. And I give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end as long as it remains within my power to prevent, there will be no blackout of peace in the United States. America launches a great new shipping venture, the liner America, the largest ship ever built in American yards the biggest so far of 500 liners and cargo ships with which the government plans to put the American flag again at the forefront of ocean-borne commerce in the next eight years. As thousands cheer, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt christens the towering vessel, and there she goes. Shortly after this epical event, the British liner Athenia, with 1,400 aboard, was torpedoed off Scotland, first victim of the war. The America, first U.S.-built luxury liner, is 723 feet long, with a tonnage of 30,000 tons. The new queen of American shipping. Canada cast her lot with England in the New World War. The Dominion Parliament, meeting in the historic government house in Ottawa, officially declares war for the first time in Canada's history as a separate dominion. War against Nazi Germany, in a proclamation signed by the Governor General of Canada and immediately forwarded to the King. Thus, Canada takes the first step in mobilizing her vast resources in men and materials in defense of the British Empire. Recruiting begins with a rush throughout the Dominion. In Vancouver, the famous Seaforth Highlander Regiment finds plenty of volunteers eager to get at the Nazis. But it will take a lot of rigorous training before they're properly seasoned. Here is one of the huge 70-ton tanks which France is throwing against the formidable defenses of the German Siegfried Line. Heavily armored, heavily powered, and maintaining one or more field pieces besides machine guns, they are veritable traveling fortresses. These military juggernauts can easily crush minor defensive installations by reason of their great weight and power. Just what they can do against more substantial fortifications remains to be seen. Battleships on land, warfare's newest terror. Thrills from a thrill-packed year. Universal Newsreel presents highlights for you sports fans, starting with America's brilliant sweep in polo over the British in the International Challenge Cup matches on Long Island. The American team took the Britishers four straight. Poetry in motion as the slow motion camera brings out the superb riding of the winners. A stunning victory. The Poughkeepsie Regatta, classic in the rowing world. Seven college crews from east and west fought it out on the Hudson River for national honors. Navy tried to uphold the tradition of the east, but California and Washington finally took the lead. A battle of the giants, and the entire nation thrilled to their prowess. An all-western duel. California kept its lead over Washington and crossed first for a new record. In the aquatic world, two graceful stars flashed across the zenith to capture the nation's eye with their breathtaking form. Ruth Jump and Marjorie Gestering, Olympic hopefuls and superb in these slow motion duets. They won new laurels with difficult dives like this to reserve a special pedestal in diving's hall of fame. 
darlings of the high board. Winter's king of sports, ski jumping, whose popularity grew by leaps and bounds last year. Thousands of converts took up the difficult but exciting sport, and many reached the dizzy heights of these experts. And many, the depths too, like this. Radar Anderson, Norwegian star, displays the amazing form that won him laurels in Canada and the US. He was the new king. Motorcycle hill climbing won thousands of new fans. And the daredevils who follow the sport won thousands of new bruises and broken bones. For every mechanical bronc rider that fell by the wayside, another took up the task. From coast to coast, still trying to defy the laws of gravity. New champs and new thrills for the fans in golf. But none as thrilling as the two-man show staged by Byron Nelson, new open champ, and Henry Picard, hard-working pro. In the PGA match, amazing shots like this put Nelson in the lead until the 36th green, and he displayed some amazing putting en route. Despite Nelson's uncanny golf, Picard displayed some fancy work of his own, tied his opponent on the 36th, and then went on to win. His first major victory and a real sports thrill. Sir Malcolm Campbell, noted racing enthusiast, gripped the imagination of the sporting world by chalking up a new speedboat record in England. His bluebird was clocked at 141 miles an hour, outstanding in a year of new speed records. The Wild West had its share of thrills and action in the year's sport parade. Thrills and near death as reckless cowhands rode raring, bucking steers and cantankerous broncs and bit the dust time and again. Another down and another breathless moment for fans from coast to coast. But if you thought that was tough, this cowboy had the biggest reverse of the year. All speed thrills were not at six miles a minute on the Utah Salt Flats. This jalopy race, and what a road, had more thrills and bumps per yard than many a Speedway Classic. Satan's Death Bowl at Jamestown, New York, with not a car under eight years old. Lena's last leap. More troops and guns for the Canal Zone in Puerto Rico. A battery of anti-aircraft guns of the 65th Coast Artillery Regiment being shipped from the West Coast aboard an Army transport to form the nucleus of a new anti-aircraft regiment to defend U.S. interest in the Caribbean. Fond farewells give the departure a wartime flavor, but it's just Uncle Sam's new move to increase the forces that protect the Panama Canal and the waterways leading to it. The final eliminations in the annual contest to choose America's reigning beauty, Miss America, is held in the Steel Pier Ballroom at Atlantic City, with selected beauties from almost every state parading in evening dresses and then in bathing suits as the hairy judges gradually narrow the field. Finally, the crown as Miss America, 1939, is given to Miss Michigan, and with it goes the cape of office from last year's queen picked for her beauty of face and figure, her charm and her talents, the new bathing queen is brown-haired Patricia Mary Donnelly, a Detroit model, just 19 years old. She's so happy she could cry, and she does. America's reigning beauty queen. Spreading their wings against a background of clouds, speedy Northrop planes of the 17th Attack Group stage a spectacular show for newsreel camera crews, the only ones doing any shooting. An impressive sight, these all-metal hornets, most up-to-date planes of their type and much sought after by foreign nations. Hundreds have been sold abroad, but now the arms embargo ends that. But embargo or not, Uncle Sam's eagles are keeping their wings in fighting trim with precision flying like this. War clouds in Europe. 
Here, fighting planes undergoing rigid test flights to keep the United States in the front ranks of military aviation. With planes and flights like these, that supremacy will soon be assured. A field of crack pedal artists gets away in the National Amateur Road Championships in Garfield Park. 25 miles of speed and turns with nary a chance to admire the park scenery. It's one of the big events in the cycle world and the pedal pushers are in an awful hurry. For amateurs, these lads get plenty of speed out of their two-wheelers. Speed, yes sir, and a new record of 57 minutes. And the winner, Irvin Pesek of Chicago. Red columns in a sudden drive have been hurled by Stalin across the Polish border on a wide front. The beleaguered Polish army, practically en route before the German onslaught, can offer but feeble resistance to the Soviet invasion. As the advancing Russian columns ride roughshod over what is left of Polish territory, the partition of Poland is arranged in Berlin and Moscow. German U-boats have registered their first major blow against the British Navy. The plane carrier Courageous, on convoy duty near the British coast, has been torpedoed and sunk. Bobbies in steel helmets and gas masks are to be seen on every hand. The cinemas have opened again, but there's a warning to dictators even here, it seems. Life goes on, of course, but behind sandbags, even in the case of weddings. What a glorious feeling it must be to expect a flock of airplane bombs and get a shower of rice or confetti. King George and Queen Elizabeth spend much of their time visiting with their subjects and inspecting air raid shelters and other defensive installations. Royal encouragement to the citizens of the crisis-stricken city. The Duchess of Kent devotes her time to war work at a London hospital. England's fourth line of defense, her harvest fields, are already being manned by girls and women as the men rapidly leave their homes for army duty. They'll probably have aching muscles tonight. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor are back in England, back home to do their bit in the war. The Duke holds a major general's commission in the army and is expected to join the British Expeditionary Force at the front shortly. All is not so quiet on the Western Front. French consolidate hard-earned war gains as advanced patrols push their way into Saar land towns, encountering stiff resistance. Here's a German memorial to victims of the last war, not far from a bridge the Nazis destroyed to stop the French advance. General Gamelin, Allied Army Chief, arrives for a staff meeting behind the lines. While up at the front, huge railway guns and other artillery pieces lay down a devastating barrage to cover further French advances. In the French capital, at the Polish church, the new president of Poland attends a special service dedicated to Poland's liberation. Designated as leader of the ill-fated nation, the new president will direct Poland's fight for freedom alongside of France. Meanwhile, the Duke of Windsor, now a major general, leaves his Paris home for somewhere in France. No longer in exile, he wants to do his bit. He saw action in the last war. New cars are out, 1940 models, having a coming out party at Grand Central Palace. It's the 40th annual auto show, setting new highs this year in safety and comfort devices for Mr. and Mrs. America. 
A rapid turnover is expected this year, giving Old Man Depression another setback. And here's a top that is tops. The younger generation okays the new models. In fact, the new styles seem to be going to their heads. The last act of a great drama, and there's that man again. Yes, sir. In the seventh inning of the fourth and last game, Keller starts the fireworks for the Yankees with another home run, his third in two days. Another sad lesson for Cincinnati in Napoleonic lore, that victory goes to those with the heaviest artillery. No sooner do the Cincinnati fans get their breath back when Bill Dickey steps up and does likewise. Two homers in a row after valiant Paul Derringer has held the Yankee batters scoreless for six full innings. The Reds make a marvelous comeback, eh, Joe, to take a 4-2 lead, but the Yanks tie it up in the ninth, and then comes the fatal tenth. Crosetti walks, and then with everybody on edge, except maybe Walters, the Reds pitcher, Keller drives to Myers, who fumbles, and all hands are safe. DiMaggio up next. Here goes the merry-go-round. He hits a single that brings Crosetti in from third with the winning run. Keller scores two. And finally, DiMaggio, as the flabbergasted Reds heave the ball around. A roundhouse finish to the World Series. Everybody has to draw the line sometime. Even the city fathers of this tobacco town in North Carolina. Here, they're not content just to paint them on the street. Anyway, traffic was no problem. Ah, but sidewalk loafers were. The middle land for pedestrians. Yeah, you heard me. If you want to discuss the war or the price of tobacco, keep back of that line. Who said that girls don't have a line? A great stunt, but some people won't learn their lines. Congress passes the neutrality bill and the emergency session comes to an end. President Roosevelt signs the joint resolution, making it the law of the land. Senator Key Pittman, author of the bill, tells what it means. Peace prevails in this country and I want to assure the fathers and the mothers that the enactment of the cash and carry law will save their sons from dying on foreign battlefields and preserve the peace of our country. On the West Coast and elsewhere, aircraft factories are going at top speed to fill huge orders of fighting planes for England, France, and other countries. Hundreds of planes have been contracted for and built and will now be shipped abroad. But meanwhile, orders expected to reach a billion dollars for over 7,000 pursuit ships and bombers will mean jobs for additional thousands of skilled workers and a tremendous boom to the nation as a whole. At Floyd Bennett Field, New York, bombing planes for England, delayed by the embargo, are loaded on barges for shipment to Staten Island, where they'll be placed aboard freighters and convoy to England. The English will be glad to see them and thousands like them soon to follow. Scandinavian rulers of Finland, Denmark, and Norway join King Gustav of Sweden at Stockholm for a conference on mutual war aid. The distinguished gathering is the signal for colorful celebration and hope for Scandinavian unity in the present crisis. Just what transpired at the meeting has not been made public, but Finland's determined opposition to Russian demands followed shortly thereafter. The situation in the Baltic took a threatening turn when the Premier of Finland returned to Helsinki from Moscow with Russia's demands. The people of Helsinki and other towns lost no time building air raid shelters and otherwise preparing for the worst. Reservists were called to the colors and by the thousands, women and children were evacuated train load after train load. Why? Because Russia has said to the Finns, 
Give us what we want, or else. Southern Methodist kicks off to Notre Dame before a crowd of 45,000. Sinclair takes the pigskin for an off-tackle smash, but he fumbles and the Mustangs get the ball down near Pater. And after a few plays, Johnson plunges six yards for a touchdown. The Irish come right back, though. Stevenson's long pass deep into Mustang territory to Kerr is ruled complete because of interference. And on the next play, it's Harry Stevenson again with a quick pass to Zantini in the end zone. The Mustangs kick up their heels again. And after a sustained drive into the second period, mostly by stocky Bob Erberger, Bob Belleville gets the ball for a nice lateral to Erberger. And Erberger races around to score. Again, the Irish arise in their wrath. O'Malley makes a beautiful 30-yard game. Next, O'Brien takes it for the Irish and moves the ball along. Finally, O'Malley takes it over to tie up the score again and is the crowd wild. The Irish stage another drive in the third period. Schwartz takes it wide around end and a run good for 10 yards or more. The ball goes to O'Malley again, and he turns the play into another Irish touchdown that puts the game on ice. The roads of France are one-way streets to the front these days for thousands of British troops. Not far away, the two high commanders, the French General Gamelin and General Vicomte Gort, meet to cook up a little deviltry to annoy the Nazi defenders of the Siegfried Line. And there's the Duke. Who calls it sunny France? Sir Kingley Wood, British Air Minister, is here too. He flew over, but he could have used a submarine. However, rain or no rain, he finds everything hotsy totsy and even sees a soccer game between British and French airmen. War or no war, Saturday night is both night in this man's army. Also, armies still do a lot of moving on foot, but these boys are taking no chances with their tootsies. Meanwhile, there's work to do. Reconnaissance and attack missions over the German lines. Speedy pursuit ships off to give battle with Nazi raiders. And when they return, they bring ample evidence in the shape of bullet holes that this war is not all a matter of deep dugouts and practice flights. A giant parking lot dedicated to the god of war. Acres and acres of new trucks, as well as tractors, waiting to be shipped to France and England. Trench diggers, too. Time and muscle savers for the modern fighting man. American factories are turning out war supplies faster than the Allies can take them away. But here's a shipment of bombing planes for Britain that's going over in a hurry. You can be sure. When you see Mae West and W.C. Fields in My Little Chickadee, you'd never think that Bill is the world's most languorous golfer. He believes in taking his golf casually. His uphill course is a natural for a restful game. The ball rolls right back every time. In fact, there's many a sip, twixt chip and cup, as it were. How is your game, Bill? Now, Lou, I did slice one this morning over through Deanna Durbin's window. She was taking a high C at the time. Found out later it black and blue with one of her tonsils. Poor little deer almost choked to death. I later asked her over to have a little gone, but she refused. The last vivid chapter in the amazing odyssey of the Nazi pocket battleship and sea raider, Admiral Graf Spee. Driven to bay, 
battered and damaged in the sanctuary of Montevideo Harbor, with many of her crew dead and wounded, the once proud Corsair of the Southern Seas faces certain doom. Ordered out of the harbor by Uruguay on threat of internment, the Nazi Captain Langsdorff must take his ship to sea to face insuperable odds. A flotilla of British warships has formed a cordon at the mouth of the Platte, waiting to put an end to the stricken enemy ship. The only other alternatives are internment or to send her to the bottom by order from Berlin and thus rob the British of the full fruits of victory. The pride of the German Navy put to the torch, scuttled, turned into a roaring furnace with oil and explosives to feed the flames of its monumental suicide at sea. Like the dusk of the gods, the ship a funeral pyre for Germania's naval hopes and aspirations. After seeing his ship sent to its doom by his own hand, small wonder that the German captain chose to follow it into oblivion. The Graf Spee, one of the most dramatic stories of 1939. These have been some of the highlights of the year 1939. War has erupted again on the bloody battlefields of Europe as the Nazis begin their plan for world domination. 1940 will see the massive bombing of cities as the Nazis overrun Europe. And because of the world crisis, President Roosevelt will defy tradition and run for an unprecedented third term. 